Hello, and welcome to the video version of Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with Dr. Kevin Weddle, author of The Complete Victory, Saratoga and the American Revolution, published February 1st, 2021 by Oxford University Press. Thank you for speaking with me. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. Good. Um, so first, how did you get into uh, studying and writing a book on this? Ah, well, um, I've always been interested in the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, I, I started getting interested in it as a cadet at West Point because uh, the revolution is all around you at West Point, of course. Mm -hmm. Still have all the old uh, Revolutionary War fortifications all over the place at West Point. And then uh, when I went back to teach at West Point as a captain in the army. Um, uh, you know, we taught, we taught it. And of course I taught uh, the Saratoga campaign. And then when I went to grad school, um, that was one of my fields of study, the uh, American Revolution. My primary field is civil war, uh, but, uh, but that was one of my secondary uh, areas of study. I was always interested in it and Oxford approached me uh, to do it. And I, I jumped at the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so then tell me how, you know, how do you take one battle and, and put it, you know, fill, fill, uh, hundreds of pages, uh, with yeah. how, how do you lay it? And especially since, you know, it's been covered a lot, you know, what yeah. you add. It, it sure has. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, and that's something I I've been telling people, you know, I, I, um, there's been a lot of really, really good books on Saratoga. Um, Ketchum's book on Saratoga, Luzader, um, recent book by Eric Snitzer, uh, all very, very good books uh, on Saratoga. And I, I think mine complements what they did and doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, override uh, the things that they did because they, for the most part, they focused on the, the tactical, you know, the, what, what's going on in the battle, what were the techniques and, and procedures and everything uh, of these, these combat soldiers on the ground. I don't ignore that. Obviously, in 500 some pages, I talk about the tactics. Uh, but my, my focus is a little bit higher. I tried to bring it up a little bit higher. And so uh, from uh, the way we would call it in, in the military is, is I focus more on the strategic and the, the operational levels of war. So, so more about the, the big decisions that were made in London and Philadelphia and New York and Quebec. Uh, by some of these key leaders that really kind of set the stage for what happens in the Saratoga campaign. And the other thing is the, 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 the book is about the Saratoga campaign, not just the two big battles uh, of Saratoga that we think about when we think about Saratoga. We think about the Battle of Freeman's Farm and then, you know, three weeks later, the Battle of, um, uh, of Bemis Heights. But as it, as it, in reality, it was a five month long campaign that actually had its origins almost a year before the surrender uh, at Saratoga uh, in, in uh, October of uh, 1777. So I cover that whole kind of grand sweep of the campaign uh, starting in the, the fall of 1776 when uh, the British try their first invasion into New York uh, coming south on Lake Champlain. Uh, it ends up in a, a I wouldn't say a failure, but they, they failed to achieve what they really wanted to do. And they retreat back up into Canada. And that really kind of kind of sets the stage for what happens later on in 1777. So I start way, way back then. And then I work my way all the way through the, the entire campaign, the surrender, and then the aftermath as well, all the diplomatic things that take place, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of the reaction that, that takes place in London and in Paris. Uh, and then, then also the, the kind of fallout that happens here in, uh, in the United States um, and all the way to when really it ends when uh, the British evacuate uh, Philadelphia in, uh, uh, in June of 1778. So, so, um, so I cover that whole, so it's, it's, it's this is grand sweep of the campaign. So I cover a lot of ground, a lot of pages, but it's also covered a lot. Of ground. So, you know, you often hear or I, I think I've often heard that, you know, as important as the colonies were to Britain, you know, it was sort of a secondary consideration for them compared to other global matters. 
yeah. for them. Can, can you address that a little bit and how it affected this ba- this campaign? Well, I, I, I would say that uh, that wasn't really the case until the French come in. So when the and when the French do come in in February officially, when they come in in February of '78, as a direct result of what happens at Saratoga, it, you know it's not the only thing that drives them to come in on our side. Overtly, they've been a covert supporter for a while, uh, but overtly, then it becomes then it truly becomes a global conflict for the Brits, uh, and it really adds a a uh, a huge level of complexity to. Uh, to their military operations and their strategy making. Uh, and they have to, and I talk about that at some length about how that it really upends their strategy because they were they're really focused on North America up to that point. Uh, but, but after that, it becomes North America clearly becomes a secondary theater and they have to now focus on Great Britain. They have to focus on things like Homeland Defense. They have to protect their other colonies uh, and other possessions like the ones in the West Indies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they have a, and they, you know, they have all of these um, uh, naval, um, you know, maritime issues. They have to protect their trade. They have to do all these other things that they really didn't have to worry about until the French come in uh, overtly on on the American side. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so definitely, uh, once once they come in on our side as a direct result of Saratoga, uh, it, it becomes a completely different ball game. And you see them actually saying. Uh, the Americans are become uh, the Americans are, se- are, are are secondary consideration now. Now that the mm-hmm. French are in. So let me ask about, um, and this might sound like more of a tactical or operational level question, but but I'm I want to know how it affects British strategy, which is how well did the British troops know the terrain and and know you know where to fight, where the centers of gravity may be, or or the important yeah. points for the, right. the colonists were, right. um, did they know the ground well enough to, to plan out, say this campaign? For one yeah. Time? Well, that's, that's a great question because, um, you, you see, there's not a whole lot of folks in the British army that have a lot of experience up in that particular area. So they have, they have, ex- you know, you have some that have experience from the French and Indian war, but that was 20 years before. So they haven't been in the area for a while. Uh, you have others with um, uh, with very limited experience. In fact, uh, the the soldiers that the British soldiers that fight in the Saratoga campaign uh, actually don't have a whole lot of combat experience. So the younger leaders have virtually no experience in the area. Some of them were on the 1776 campaign, but that one really went you know just went south on Lake Champlain. They got as far as Crown Point, and they turned around and went back. So they didn't have to do any hard campaigning through the wilderness uh, that they will they will shortly find out in 1777 when they take Port Ticonderoga very, very quickly. Now the hard part begins and they have to actually campaign through this very, very difficult terrain. Uh, And also you have the the strategy makers sitting back there in London, people like the king, uh, people like George Germain, who's the secretary of state for the colonies. He's really the civilian minister former general, but he's a civilian minister who's responsible for um, coordinating the military operations in North America. Uh, he's, he's a bit of a micromanager. He doesn't have any experience in North America. He thinks, you know, he, he is sending these messages that indicate a total um, uh, unfamiliarity with the challenges of operating in North America. Um, he doesn't realize, and, and you kind of get this impression as you read his letters, that he doesn't really realize how difficult it is to move these vast distances through this very forbidding terrain. And so he's saying things like to, to General Howe, um, he's saying, well, okay, you go ahead and go to Philadelphia, but you know, once you knock out that campaign, you need to turn around and go back up and help for going. Well, you know, Howe is saying, you're crazy. I can't do that. That's 300 miles away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it might take me a while to actually finish the Philadelphia campaign before I can possibly detach any forces to go help we're going. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's things like that. I mean, he just has no, no notion of space and time. And he's the one who's trying to coordinate all these operations. Uh, so, so it's limited. Uh, they have limited experience. Again, the folks who participated in the French and Indian War, they've got some experience, but it's for most of them, it's, it's dated experience. 
so so they they just they just don't. And of course, the young soldiers have no experience uh, in that um, in that terrain. And you can you can tell. You know, I I, I looked at a lot of letters of British soldiers, um, some officers, some soldiers, the German soldiers who were with them. And they are just absolutely, you know, they're terrified of the, of the flora and fauna. Uh, you know, they run into rattlesnakes uh, on the way down and they're just, they're just, you know, uh, terrified of the, of the, uh, of the American, uh, um, you know, um, uh, insects and snakes and things like that, that they run into. They're always talking about, you know, we're getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and black flies, uh, you know, things that we're, oh yeah, you go up to Northern New York and that's what you're going to run into. You know, it's for, for us, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, that's what happens. But they had never experienced anything like that. Because uh, even the ones who participated in the 1776 campaign, uh, when they went uh, south on Lake Champlain, it was already late in the season. There had already been hard frost. So they didn't have the experience with the bugs that they experienced when in 1777. So it's just, it's those kind of things. I mean, there's all these little things that we don't think about, but but that was really tough on these guys uh, as they were experiencing them, them for the first time. Of course, the Americans are experiencing the exact same thing, but they're, they're a little bit more used to it. They're not terrified by a rattlesnake that they run into because they, you know, they've experienced that before. I'm speaking with Kevin Weddle, author of The Complete Victory. You can find more information about the book on the Oxford University Press website. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was a safe assumption that the Continental Army and the militias state militias um actually what uh who who what forces were involved in the campaign before i start asking questions yeah so there were um from, on the american side there's a there's a combination of, of continental soldiers and and militia uh the militia are drawn from as you might expect drawn from new york uh, but also heavily drawn from new hampshire lots of new hampshire uh regiments uh, and then a lot of Massachusetts regiments, some Connecticut regiments, uh, uh, but mostly mostly New England and New York uh, regiments uh, are involved in the Saratoga campaign, and that and that's pretty much true for the Continental forces as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so they, you know, so terrain wise, you know, the conditions, like you say, they would have been more more used to, it, even though there are some surprises for them. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in a sense, I'm wondering, so strategic, so on the U.S. side, strategically, did they take, I, I, I feel like I'm crossing lines between operational planning and, and strategy here, sure, but sure. did they consider British missteps? What, were they anticipating, you know, what, were they getting the feel that the British weren't properly managing their forces? Uh, not, certainly not at the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, when Burgoyne comes down, or, I keep on saying comes down Lake Champlain. He's actually going up Lake Champlain, even though he's heading south because Lake Champlain drains north. Mm -hmm. So he's coming south on Lake Champlain. Uh, he, he very, very quickly seizes Fort Ticonderoga. I mean, it's a, it's a virtually a bloodless siege of about two days. He sieges Fort Ticonderoga. It's a huge shock to the American system. Um, Virtually every American leader felt that Fort Ticonderoga was virtually impregnable. There's no way the, the Brits can take uh, Fort Ticonderoga. Or if, it, if they do, it'll take them a long, long time. It'll delay them well into the fall. By that time, it'll be too late for them to do much of anything. So it's a huge shock when Burgoyne takes uh, Fort Ticonderoga very quickly. So as you might expect, the Americans are... Um, Kind of really thrown back on their heels, and there's especially uh, the the 
the leaders in the Northern Army itself, you know, the folks who were actually fighting Burgoyne. So the, uh, the commander of Fort Ticonderoga, um, Arthur St. Clair, uh, the commander of the Northern Department and the Northern Army, Philip Schuyler. Um, it just, I mean, he, he's thrown into the depths of despair, Philip Schuyler. Uh, Washington is, now he's the commander in chief, obviously, of the entire American war effort to include the Northern Army. He's the commander in chief of the whole shooting match. So, you know, Washington is shocked as well. Uh, just like all the congressmen, the populace, everybody is, is, is really uh, dismayed at what happened there. Uh, but Washington looks at the situation up there in, uh, in New York, and he, he tells Schuyler in a series of letters, says, look, um, I don't think Burgoyne realizes how tough it's going to be as he starts heading south. So you need to look for opportunities to, to you know, attack him. He's going to have to de detach certain forces away from his main body to, to go look for supplies and things like that. So you need to look for opportunities to go after those detached units and things like that. So he's telling him, uh, he's giving uh, Schuyler advice very, very shortly after Fort Ticonderoga falls. So, so Washington sees opportunities. Uh, even though Washington is very uh, you know, concerned about the threat uh, that Burgoyne is posing, uh, he also sees some opportunities uh, and he's trying to, to kind of coach. You see him really coaching Schuyler along the way, trying to give him advice on, on what to do because Schuyler, at least the letters that are coming into Washington and coming to Congress uh, indicate a commander who is, uh, who is almost on the verge of panic uh, mm -hmm. after, after Burgoyne takes uh, Ticonderoga. Now, and to, to steal from sort of a modern concept, um, was Washington, was there British Army doctrine, so to speak, that Washington was familiar with, or did he just know the practice, the British practice of war? Yeah, I think, I think it's just his, his self-taught knowledge of war in general mm -hmm. uh, and his knowledge of the terrain. I mean, he understands the terrain uh, up there. I mean, he doesn't have a whole lot of personal experience up there, but he has, you know, he fought the French and Indian War, obviously. Uh, so he's got a great deal of experience being in the wilderness. So he, you know, he can look at the map. He understands uh, uh, the different routes and everything else and the, and the challenges that Burgoyne is going to face. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's it's just his innate uh, knowledge of, of military operations, self-taught, obviously, and through experience. Um, but I, I don't think it's so much a knowledge of British doctrines such as it was. Um, and um, so you... You mentioned earlier, I think, um, if I understood correctly, so you s sort of have a high level look at the campaign. Yeah. Um, how did, um, as the campaign progressed politically, um, what was the, the Congress, you know, the, the, the various states representatives, how were they, um, what were their thoughts about first Ticonderoga and then as everything progressed? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because you have to go back a little bit. In the, in the spring of 1777, there's a big um, controversy over who is to command the Northern Department. Um, Schuyler had left the Northern Department. He was the commander of the Northern Department. He had left the Northern Department to go down to Congress to kind of plead his case. He had been getting a lot of criticism uh, and he wanted to go down to, uh, to uh, Congress to, to basically plead his case. So he leaves. In the meantime, Congress had sent uh, Horatio Gates up to the Northern Department to take command of Fort Ticonderoga. So Gates gets up to uh, Albany, which is the headquarters of the Northern Department. Gates or uh, Schuyler has left. And he says, well, you know, I'm the senior guy here. I'm going to take command. So he basically assumes command of the Northern Department without authorization. So there's, and, and so you, you, so what you have is you have this kind of controversy of who is really commanding the Northern Department. And you have a New England wing, the New England Congress, uh, congressmen, delegates uh, to Congress were, were big Horatio Gates fans. The, the New York and Middle Colony folks were big uh, Schuyler fans. So you had these two factions in Congress who, uh, who wanted their guy to be in command of the Northern Department. In the end, they have a vote uh, in, oh gosh, I can't remember the, the dates. I want to say early May. It may have been late April. I, I can't remember exactly. But they have a vote and they said, no, no, no. Schuyler is still the guy. So they send Schuyler back up to retake command. Uh, so he does that. 
Arnold, or excuse me, not Arnold, Gates leaves in a, he's, he's very upset about it. He goes to Congress and he's, you know, swearing at him. He's very upset about it. Uh, they basically kick him out of Congress when he, when he goes down there to protest. So, so you have this, so in other words, you have a couple months where you don't really have any unity of command up there in the Northern Department. You have, you know, both these two generals are lobbying their Congress people, their factions to, to vote for them. Uh, to command the Northern Department. So the Northern Department is a little bit different than the rest of the, the American military. Mm -hmm. um, Washington doesn't have uh, total control. Congress has its hands in the Northern Department more than they do the rest of the military establishment. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's really Congress that is going to uh, end up appointing commanders uh, to the Northern Department. They ask Washington for his advice and so forth, but but they end up being the ones who, who command uh, appoint commanders to the Northern Department. Um, so it's a little bit, a little bit different situation there. And Washington has to carefully play that. There's political, you know, obviously domestic political issues that he has to be careful with because he doesn't want to upset either the, you know, the New York faction or the, or the New England faction of the, of the delegates in Congress. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a long roundabout way of saying that, once Ticonderoga falls, obviously Schuyler's, um, Schuyler's uh, reputation falls with it. Uh, and ultimately, as Burgoyne will slowly, slowly continue south toward Albany, uh, Congress will finally decide to relieve Schuyler and appoint uh, Gates to command in his place. And that mm -hmm. happens in uh, early August. So, yeah, so Ticonderoga is this huge, you know, it's a huge, big deal. It will end up being um, sort of Schuyler's downfall, that and all of his constant pessimistic letters that he's sending to Washington and, and Congress, uh, that, that they're going to contribute as well. Would uh, Is there anyone involved in the decision making and planning on the American side that would surprise readers, you know, someone who you wouldn't, ex or some group or individuals who, who maybe had more power in, in all that was going on then? Um, well, I, I would go back to, again, I would go back to Washington. Washington is, the, I mean, when you, when you look at planners, you know, they didn't have the staffs we think of today as, as planners. There was really the, in the commanders, you know, the commander was the guy who was the planner. Mm -hmm. They had staffs, but they weren't doing the sorts of st staff sort of stuff that our staffs do today. Um, so he didn't have a planning staff that would come to him with, sir, we're offering you three options here. You know, we, we should do this, we do that, or whatever. I mean, that's what we do today, right? But um, uh, he didn't have anything like that. So it, I mean, it's it's all in his his mind. He's obviously, at, he asked for advice with his, to his subordinate commanders and things like that. Uh, but but really it's, it's Washington. And one of the big kind of themes of the book is I compare Washington as commander in chief and General Howe as commander in chief. Mm -hmm. um, the British commander in chief uh, in North America. And you see Washington is a, to me, he's a true commander in chief. He's looking at the big picture. He understands that anything that happens in the Northern department is going to impact what he's doing down there in, in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey with the main army. Um, uh, and, and the same with, with what's happening in the Hudson Highlands. He's got a small army in the Hudson Highlands. Later he'll have the Southern department. So anyway, he's the true commander in chief. He's looking at all that. He's trying to coordinate all of those operations. How is in 1777, the summer of 1777, is laser focused on Philadelphia. And he, even when Burgoyne moves into Howe's area of operations that Howe is responsible for, um, he's basically telling Burgoyne, you're on your own. I'm focused on Philadelphia. And it's 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 an interesting contrast how these two guys handle their responsibilities as commander in chief. My my argument is Washington was a true commander in chief, looking at the entire big picture. How was laser focused on Philadelphia and and, and basically let Burgoyne do his own thing. Hmm. Um, and so so in other words, he wasn't providing any advice, any support, anything else to uh, to Burgoyne. Uh, it, with the exception of a letter he writes in, in, in April of 1777 that basically tells Burgoyne, hey, I know you're probably expecting me to come up the Hudson River to meet you at Albany, 
I'm not coming there. I'm heading to Philadelphia. So don't expect me. Don't expect any help from me. Um, and by the way, use your initiative as you see fit. So that's about the best guidance he gets from Powell. Was any of that a factor of, you mentioned this um, official in London who was a bit of a micromanager, you said a micromanager, I believe. Right, George Germain, right. Was any of that, you know, was his attitude maybe, you know, they're taking care of that that level of thinking and I'm just focused on the military matters? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because I spend a lot of time working through the um, how the British strategy came about for 1777. So the, at the end of 1776, the British realized that you know, the war is not going to be over anytime soon. So we've got to come up with a, a war winning strategy for 1777. We can't let this thing drag out forever. So they, they come up with, you know, the, the strategy and you basically have, Two people are proposing a strategy for 1777. Howe, who's the commander in chief in New York, and John Burgoyne, who has left Canada and sailed back to London. So he's there in London at the end of 1776. He presents his plan, and through letters, uh, Howe presents his plan. Uh, Burgoyne's plan is that three pronged, the, the kind of classic Saratoga campaign that just about everybody knows about this three prongs, three columns that are convert that will converge on um, uh, Albany, one coming down from Canada, one coming down the Mohawk River Valley through the middle of New York, and the other one going up the uh, Hudson. They'll converge on Albany, they'll split the more rebellious um, uh, New England colonies away from the middle colonies, and hopefully then, you know, the revolution will die on the vine and and so forth. So that's that's Burgoyne's plan. Um, Howe presents his own plan. Howe's plan is, look, I think Washington's army is the center of gravity, Washington and his army. So I'm going to go to Philadelphia with the main army. I'm going to, by, by, by seizing Philadelphia, I'm going to force Washington to defend the capital, the pseudo capital uh, of America, because uh, that's where Congress is. Um, and then by doing that, I'm going to lure him into a decisive battle. I'll destroy his army. That will end the rebellion. Mm. So that's that's Howe's plan. So it's it's Germain's job to reconcile these plans and come up with a coordinated strategy for 1777. What ends up happening is it's a totally un instead of one coordinated strategy, you have two separate, uncoordinated, unsupporting strategies. He basically says, how, yes, I approve your strategy. You can go to Philadelphia. Um, oh, and by the way, in small print, once you finish Philadelphia, go up and help Burgoyne. For Burgoyne, it's, yes, absolutely, you knock out your strategy uh, as, as planned. But, um, um, but how's going to go to Philadelphia, but then he's going to come up and help you when he's done. So, so again, you know, that's, and, and, and you might say, well, you know, you can probably reconcile that. But the problem is it takes a letter, um, you know, it's 3,000 miles away, right? So it takes a letter up to two months to get to go one way. And then, of course, the reply takes another you know, six weeks to come back and then another, you know. So, so coordinating that and trying to micromanage that from a distance from 3,000 miles away. Uh, and, and, and at least Burgoyne's strategy is very, very complex, lots of moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, that's very, very difficult. And it's almost doomed to failure. And what I do, I, so I have an appendix, <laughs> a very detailed appendix where I try to follow every letter that goes every, you know, letter and meeting and, and memo and things in order that goes back and forth across the Atlantic showing, you know, when it was sent, when it was received. Mm -hmm. And so you can get a, you can, by kind of following this table that I created, you can kind of see where, you know, things are just going off the rails. Mm -hmm. Because how will receive a, you know, a letter saying, I've approved your plan. He goes, yeah, great. I, they've, I'm going to Philadelphia. Um, and then once he's at sea, because he, he takes it, he moves his army by sea to Philadelphia. Once he's at sea, when it's too late to do much of anything, he gets, you know, the follow on letter saying, and oh, by the way, help Burgoyne when you're done. <laughs> you know, things like that. So it's just, it's just crazy. And, and Burgoyne sails to Quebec to get ready to do his part of the campaign, thinking that Howe has been ordered to come up the Hudson River. 
when he hasn't. He's been, a, you know, he's been approved to go to Philadelphia. So that's one of these, you know, myths of Saratoga. I, well, maybe not a myth, but a misunderstanding. A lot of people argue that how disobeyed orders by not going up the Hudson River to support um, uh, to support Burgoyne, but that's not the case at all. His his plan was approved by uh, by the king and Germain uh, to go to Philadelphia. So uh, just so you can see, just the confusion and uncoordination of these strategies. So so the British their their strategy was fatally flawed to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so you know one of the truisms I think of of military strategy is you know, even the best tactics can't rescue a bad strategy. And the Brits had a bad strategy. And despite the fact that they had this wonderful, well-trained professional army, um, it wasn't going to rescue this very bad strategy. I'm speaking with Kevin Weddle, author of The Complete Victory. You can find more information about the book on the Oxford University Press website. If you like this episode of Military History Inside Out so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. Please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. So that sort of anticipates the next question or this question, which is if, if, Britain had a more powerful, someone with a bigger mandate in North America who could coordinate all this better and you could, yeah. you know, get get away from these communication issues. Let's say the yeah. king said, you know what, so-and-so, you go and manage it. Yeah. Yeah. That, how much would that have helped the British if they had someone like that? Oh, I think it would have, it, 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 it would have changed everything. I mean, to me, you know, the logical... The logical fix for the communications problem is you pick the best guy you can, you make him commander in chief, you give him basic guidance, basic guidance. I don't know. You know, personally, I think the basic guidance should have been for the British. I think Howe had the right idea. I mean, I, I argue in the book that I think he had the right strategy. I think Washington and the big army was the center of gravity of the revolution. You destroy, you destroy that, you take Washington out, and, you know, not kill him, but you know, capture him, whatever. Um, the revolution is essentially over uh, at that point. I mean, what else are you going to do? Um, so, so I, I think they should have said something like this: You know, General Howe, you're our guy. Your mission: track down, destroy Washington's army, capture Washington, and the revolution. Period. Here are the assets. Uh, you know, what what do you need from us? What are the assets and resources you need from us? Oh, you need another army. Okay, Burgoyne's army up there in Canada. We're going to put him on ships. We're going to sail him around to New York City. Then you've got this huge army. And you can, you know, no matter how long it takes, you can track down Washington. It's big enough that you can actually track him down and, and, and chase him to ground and destroy mm -hmm. him. Um, and you've got the power of the Royal Navy, which the Americans can't hope to do anything about. In fact, Washington, you know, throughout this entire period, Washington's letters, he's, he's lamenting all, it seems like every other letter, he's lamenting the fact that the Brits have the Royal Navy and he's got no sea power. And so they can load their guys up on a ship and appear, you know, behind him, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or up in Rhode Island or down in Charleston. And he can't do anything about it. There's nothing he can do about it. Yeah. Uh, so they have the Royal Navy. They have, you know, they have the manpower. Um, how you figure out what to do. We're going to tell you, we're going to give you general terms, what we want you to accomplish. You figure out how to, how to skin that cat. Um, that would have been the way to do it. So well, I agree with you 100%. Hmm. Um, uh, were, were Native Americans at all an issue? Um, their participation or their, you know, a threat from Native Americans, was that at all an issue here? Uh, yeah, the, the Native Americans had a huge role in, in this campaign. Um, the, uh, there, 
Burgoyne had a big contingent of Native Americans with him. Uh, it, there, we're unsure about what the numbers were, but they're anyway between 500 and 1,000. You know, it was hard to calculate. You see all these different numbers uh, floating around. And then the, the, um, the column that came down the Mohawk or was supposed to come down the Mohawk River, they only get as far as Fort Stanwix in, in New York, near present-day Rome, New York. Um, so, so they also have a large contingent of uh, Native Americans. There's almost no Native Americans on the side. The, the Oneida Indians are on the American side. Um, and some Tuscarora uh, tribe uh, members are on the American side. But virtually all the other Native Americans are on the British side. Hmm. So, so they have these big contingents of Native Americans. The Americans have very small, very, very small contingents of, of Native Americans, if they have any at all. Hmm. So... Um, uh, so, yeah, so they play a, a huge role. Um, they are really good for the Brits uh, as, as scouts, uh, as sort of their eyes and ears for the, for the Brits. They can send them out in front of the army uh, and, and, you know, scout and, and, uh, uh, and do that sort of thing. They're also really good at protecting the flanks of the British army as they're moving through the wilderness. Uh, but the problem is they... Um, uh, because of their very small numbers per tribe, uh, they can't take heavy casualties. So when they do take heavy casualties at the Battle of Bennington and at the uh, Battle of Oriskany, which is, uh, again, at, um, uh, uh, on the Mohawk River near Fort Stanwix, uh, pretty much once they, once they sustain some heavy casualties, they leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just, they just pack up and leave. And so um, that's what happens as, as we're going penetrates further and further and further into the uh, American wilderness, um, pretty soon he finds himself after Bennington without all of his Native Americans. Uh, well, virtually, no. I mean, there, he's got a small, tiny contingent left, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a big problem for him uh, as he continues forward. Uh, and they also cause other problems. Uh, they are, um, they're, they're hard to control. They're hard to manage. Um, he, uh, he makes them uh, promise not to commit any atrocities, uh, but they go ahead and do that anyway. Um, they're, they're pretty indiscriminate when they, when they do commit some of these atrocities. Uh, they kill loyalists as well as patriots, um, uh, men, women, and children. That, of course, is going to be a problem for Burgoyne because one of his assumptions in his planning was that loyalists will be coming out of the, out of the woodwork to, to support him. As, as he moves through New York, turns out not to be the case. Uh, and a lot of that is because of um, uh, the Native Americans that he has with them. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's, they, they, they're good. Uh, they're double-edged sword, basically. They're, they're, they're good for them and they're bad for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they, they will cause all sorts of uh, problems for him as he gets further and further along uh, in the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, they also are very politically uh, fraught. Uh, because the, uh, uh, the politicians back in London, uh, especially as you might expect, the ones who are, who are not pro the American war, and there's plenty of them, they're very vocal. They're fairly small, but they're very, very vocal. And they have some big names, people like Pitt, uh, who was the prime, you know, the prime minister during the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, who really created the great you know, British Empire. Uh, so Pitt is uh, anti the American war, Edmund Burke. Uh, Charles Fox, uh, all these big names that we've heard about over the years, they're very, very anti-war. Uh, and so they, they seize on these uh, 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 Burgoyne and others, other British using these uh, Native Americans, and they, they condemn it uh, um, uh, very, very strongly in Parliament. And of course, on the American side, what we do is um, we use those atrocities to our advantage. Of course, and that that's one of the things that is going to help to bring out the militia in the later uh, later later stages of the campaign is some of the atrocities that the uh, um, that the Burgoyne's uh, uh, Native Americans will commit. It's interesting, and uh, perhaps I'll unfairly do this, but two of the things you mentioned about the British strategy that that strike me as failures. America has suffered in 20th and 21st century wars is number one, winning hearts and minds. And number two, yeah. you know, having the trying to draw the enemy into that one big battle to destroy their forces and then they'll give up. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I'm curious if you could kind of address Yeah. That. Well, yeah. Um, uh, in my concluding chapter of the book, I, I kind of circled back and I, the two big themes of my book, I think are strategy and leadership. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of circled back in my last chapter to, to kind of tease out some what I think are, are big lessons of this campaign. And I think any current uh, senior military or political leader could read that and, and hopefully get something out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and one of those is, is strategy. Obviously, I think, I think my personal feeling is we haven't done strategy well in the United States since World War II. I really don't. I mean, we, we did it pretty well in World War II. I mean, it was we had this very difficult, challenging coalition with us and the Brits and the, and the uh, Soviets. Um, and it was a real challenge working through all those issues because all of us had our own national interests, and national objectives uh, had to be they had to be subordinated to the coalition interests. But still, you know, there's all sorts of disagreements and problems there. But we worked through them. We worked through them pretty well. And we won a global war. Um, the period since then, I, well, I think, you know, things like containment and all that, they were fairly successful, but I think really we have not done strategy well since World War II. Um, and, and I think you can, you can look at the lessons uh, from the British in particular here in the Saratoga campaign and go, yeah, I can kind of see, I can see us in, in some of those things that they did. And those are some of the things that we really have to do better at as we go forward. Mm -hmm. So, Things uh, like, you know, establishing objectives, clear objectives. You know, mm-hmm. what do you want to accomplish? What exactly do you want to do? For Burgoyne's part of the strategy, there was no big objective except everybody's going to get to Albany. And then when these three columns converge, good things will happen. Well, that's, you know, that's not really good strategy. That's you, you got to have a clearly defined and decisive objective. Uh, and just just having some challenging military maneuvers be your objective. Yes, we pulled off this great, you know, these great three marches to Albany. Yeah, no, that's not, you know, what are you going to do now? I mean, what's, yeah. what's the follow-on operation? It was very vague. It was, well, then we're going to kind of do some, we're going we're, we're gonna to maybe do some operations toward the Connecticut River and to northern Massachusetts and maybe towards Boston. Well, okay, that's yeah, very, very nebulous. Um, so anyway, you know, I'm, 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 I'm babbling here a little bit now, but, okay. but I, I really think there's many things that we can look at with the Saratoga campaign and, and, and see ourselves over these past 20, 30 years of strategy that hasn't been all that successful. And we need to, I think we need to look hard at our ability to, to conduct strategy in the United States. So let me turn to um, the resources you used for your research. Um, what, what did you use? Uh, well, I, I, um, uh, lots of primary sources, uh, the, the, a uh, lot of British primary sources in particular, cause I really take apart their strategy because the American strategy is fairly straightforward. Mm-hmm. Uh, British strategy is incredibly complex and you have to sort of tease out all these different things. So, uh, I spent oh, weeks at the, uh, David library of the American revolution, which used to be at Washington's crossing, uh, Pennsylvania. It's now moved to Philadelphia. Uh, but wonderful repository of all these these um, these great primary documents, uh, the colonial office records and things like that. Uh, so, it, you know, I didn't have to travel to London to look at all of them. I had them right there. Uh, also, the Clements Library at University of Michigan is this incredible repository of you wouldn't think it would be there. But uh, the, the senior British officers uh, papers. So there were, you know, the papers of George Germain, the papers of um, Henry Clinton. Uh, it's just just really great stuff. Um, so did a lot of work here at Carlisle Barracks. We have the Army Heritage and Education Center, which has a great archive and uh, library. So mm-hmm. spent a lot of times uh, there. Um, so um, just just a lot of there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, so published and and primary sources. So. So what part of uh, all the research was most enjoyable? That's a great question. I um, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Uh, the, um, 
I, no, no, I'm trying to figure, you know, what was the best? Um, yeah. I think the most user friendly was the David Library. I mean, that was a place where I'd walk in and I'd be the only one there all day long. So it was great, you know, and, and uh, so the, you know, librarians would just, you know, help me get whatever I needed. So that was great stuff. Uh, the Clements Library, I think, was may have been the most fun because, you know, being able to go through these these private papers, private and public papers of these key British leaders. Um, when I was done with with uh, that segment of my research, and again, I spent many, many days at the Clements Library. They were wonderful as well. Um, I really felt like I, I, I had this connect. I'm not a huge like, Anglophile. So so I think that helped me be fair in my assessment of the, the British leaders. Uh, so it really, um, really enjoyed that. And I, I came out feeling, um, feeling like I actually had a little bit of empathy for them because they had a tough mission. I mean, it was a tough nut to crack uh, the mm -hmm. British mission to, to put down this, uh, the American rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that would, that was fun. How um, did you, did they feel like they were fighting fellow Brits or did they feel like they were dealing with a different, just a different group of people? Yeah, that's, that's really a, that's a great question. My, my sense of it is um, early on, they felt like they were fighting more countrymen. Uh, but as things, as things can, as you might expect, as the war progressed, uh, they were all taking a harder and harder line. Um, there were some who, who felt, you know, the, the entire time, Hey, there are countrymen. We've got to, we've got to, th this can't be a hard war. We've got to, uh, treat prisoners. Well, we've got to, you know, that, that kind of, and, and the town, you know, the, the, uh, uh, American, uh, just the civilians, we have to treat them well and things like that. And others had a much more of a hard line. It, it depended on the person. But in general, uh, as the war progressed, and this, this is just, I think, human nature, uh, most of them started to take more of a hard line as the war progressed. Mm -hmm. um, what did you come across that most surprised you? Um, hmm. I think it was Washington's role. Um, you know, Washington is, is uh, it's not that he's not discussed uh, by other historians when they talk about the Saratoga campaign, but uh, I don't think they, uh, most people have attributed uh, such a big role to him. I think he paid, played a huge role. And at the same time, he's juggling all these other balls because he's also dealing with facing Howe, who's coming to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, so he's dealing with that. He's dealing with Congress on a daily, hourly basis. Uh, he's dealing with all of these governors of these uh, these states because he's appealing for a militia. He's appealing for supplies. Uh, he's doing that. He's dealing with the army up in, in the Hudson Highlands. He's dealing with the Northern Army, uh, who's facing Burgoyne. He's doing all that, and you know he's he's basically a one man band. Uh, with you know he's got aides and you know quartermasters and things like that. But but he's really he's really running the whole show and it's really, uh, it's really an amazing thing to see. And also the other piece I think is the, the whole strat, the whole British strategy piece, trying to unravel uh, what happened with all that. Mm -hmm. that. That was fun too. And, and a bit of a surprise. Hmm. Did, uh, did you get the sense and, you know, a million biographies of Washington have been written, but yeah, was, was Washington still, despite the, the pressures, did he seem in his letters calm, you know, like just assessing it calmly or was there any bit of panic? or Panic, <laughs> yeah. Well, he gets excited a few times for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, I think he's, he, he was able to keep a pretty, pretty even keel uh, as he went through all this. And, and the summer of 1777, I mean, it's a period of really high stress. Because you've got this seemingly uh, unbeatable column coming down from Canada with Burgoyne, because the way they, they seize Ticonderoga, again, it's, it's like, holy crap, are we going to be able to stop these guys? Um, uh, so you've got that issue. You've got Howe and his big army. They've just embarked on ships, sailed out from New York, and Washington's going, where are they going? i got to figure out where they're going. Oh, my God. I don't know. They could show up behind me. They could show up at, you know, wherever. Um, so he's dealing with all this stuff at the same time. So it's, it's, it's really high pressure and, and yeah, I think he handles it pretty darn well. Did he, were, who, 
who did the Fre did the French have any advisors or observers there at the time? At well, I mean, they they've sent over they've sent over folks to assist. So we've got it seems like you know almost every day Congress is sending another French general to Washington to here use this guy. <laughs> and, and so that's the other thing that Washington is dealing with too. You know, well, okay, what am I going to do with this guy? I got to figure out what it, you know, what his skills are, what you know, what he can really bring me. Does he speak English? Does you know all these other different issues that he's got to deal with there? Because there's there's French officers up in the uh, northern department. Uh, there are French officers with him. Uh, you know, so he's, he's dealing with all that. So the French are obviously they're supporting us in a covert fashion uh, at this point. It's not until much later that they'll actually, after the, they signed the treaty in February of 78, uh, that they finally start providing, at first they'll provide us some sea power assistance. And then later on, of course, they'll land an entire army, which will end up at, at Yorktown, of course. Mm -hmm. Were there any other... Uh, nations involved that we don't hear about that no one really talks about, you, you know, uh, I would imagine small ones. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the Spanish will come in uh, the war uh, a little bit later on. Um, and you, you know, the Americans are constantly trying to ask the Netherlands for assistance as well. Hmm. Um, they, they, they do a, you know, fairly, uh, significant diplomatic effort uh, with the, the Netherlands. Um, if, I, if I remember right, I think Adams was part of that delegation that when, when Adams goes over to join uh, Franklin and the rest of the team in Paris. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there are others that, that we're seeking assistance from. Uh, mainly, we're trying to get some money from them, uh, you know, monetary assistance to help us out. Uh, but it's primarily the French. I mean, the French are providing you know, these, these officers that are helping us. And when I said general, they're not all generals they're colonels and lieutenant colonels and things, but um, they're, they're helping us with these officers. They're helping us with supplies. They're helping us with arms uh, as well. Um, so it's, it's mainly the French. So um, knowing that, you know, there's always a lot of gaps doing historical research. Was there a particular question that was the most difficult for you to research and either you did finally get an answer or you're still not satisfied. Hmm. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that I don't, you know, there were some, there's some things that, um, that I don't think anybody will ever be able to answer things like who really shot Simon Fraser, you know, at the battle of Bemis Heights, there's a bit, you know, supposedly it was one of Morgan's sharpshooters uh, Corporal Timothy Murphy, you know, and all that stuff. I, for the life of me, I don't see how there's any way we can identify one guy who shot Simon Fraser. Simon Fraser was Brigadier General Fraser, probably Burgoyne's best, uh, most aggressive, uh, most capable general officer under him. Um, um, I don't think there's any way. Personally, I don't think there's any way, number one, that, that we know that Murphy did it, but I don't think there's any way we could ever find out. So I think that's one of those things that are that's just unknowable. Uh, the other thing is the famous um, uh, the famous um, episode of the murder of Jane McCrae uh, by supposedly by Burgoyne's Native Americans. Um, I think it was probably more like friendly fire uh, that killed her. Uh, but again, that's unknowable. We're never gonna we're never gonna know that. Um, so it's things like that. I mean, it, but. You know, I, it doesn't didn't really bother me that, you know, you can't really find an answer to that. It's just one of those things that, you know, I just in the in the book, I just said, yeah, we're, you know, I have no idea who shot who shot Simon Fraser, but somebody did. And, and he, you know, he died the next morning and that was a huge loss for Burgoyne. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been one of the riflemen. It could have been one of his own men. It could have been a friendly fire incident. We just absolutely don't know. There's no way we can know. Mm -hmm. So the two battles, um, were they, w when they occurred, uh, were they battles where the Americans won against the odds or at that point were they sort of foregone conclusions oh, yeah. as, as far as the outcome? Right. No, I, I don't think either one were, the, the, uh, were foregone. Uh, the, the first battle, uh, the one that takes place on the 19th of, of September, commonly called the Battle of Freeman's Farm, mm -hmm. um, and that one, both sides are, are almost even. Uh, in fact, the numbers are just a couple hundred different. Um, so 
So both sides have about 6,500 troops uh, at that at that battle. Um, and what what Gates has done is he's moved the army to uh, um, high ground on a place called Bemis Heights. It overlooks the the river, the Hudson River, and the the road to Albany. So he's he's basically guarding those two routes. One of those two routes uh, Burgoyne has to take to get to Albany. So he's, he's basically guarding that by being up on the high ground. And when Burgoyne starts moving his army in three columns to try to, try to either get past uh, Gates or to circle around Gates and hit him in the, in the left flank, basically what Gates does is he keeps the vast bulk of the army behind their fortifications and he sends out um, basically detachments of the army to, to, to stop uh, Burgoyne's advance. And it works. Uh, he stops, he's able to stop Burgoyne's advance. Uh, Burgoyne claims a victory because he forces the Americans to fall back into their fortifications. But, but really, I mean, it's, it's more or less a draw, uh, that, first, that first battle. And the British take many more casualties than the Americans do. The problem with Burgoyne at this point is the American army is starting to swell as more and more militia troops arrive. And so as the Americans are getting bigger, the Brits are, are getting smaller because many Brits are starting, when I say Brits, I mean the British and the Germans because uh, he's got a big German contingent there as well. So uh, the Brits and the Germans are starting to desert. Um, they're running out of food uh, by this time. He has to reduce rations like three times uh, after the Battle of Freeman's Farm uh, because they're running out of food. Uh, and he starts to get desperate uh, at that point. And by the time of the second battle of Saratoga, uh, usually called the Battle of Bemis Heights, and that takes place on the 7th of October, um, now Gates has about 11,000 troops. And of course, Burgoyne has just about 6,000 troops by that point. So now Burgoyne is heavily outnumbered three weeks later uh, at the Battle of Bemis Heights. By this point, um, he, and actually he should have made the decision well before this time, but he's so, he's, he's in such trouble in terms of food, both for his men and for his animals, that he decides to lead out this, uh, uh, 1500 man, 1700 man, something like that, uh, reconnaissance force to try to forage for some food. And then also to see if there's any way possible that he can still swing past gates and still head toward Albany. Um, this 1,700-man force, he personally leads out of his fortifications. Uh, Gates, once again, keeps the vast bulk of the army behind his fortification, sends out brigades, basically piecemeal, very much like he does at the Battle of Freeman's Farm. Uh, they take on this, uh, this reconnaissance force, force them to fall back in disarray into their fortifications. Because they're in total disarray as they fall back, the Americans are able to seize uh, uh, the, the British fortifications on their far right flank. And that meant that, that Burgoyne now has to fall back because now he's got the Americans sitting firmly on his right flank uh, and there's nothing much he can do except to try to fall back. And, and he falls back. Um, this, is what, this is when Simon Fraser is, is mortally wounded uh, during that battle. Uh, he tries to fall back, but I mean, his army is exhausted. It's pouring rain. It's getting cold. Uh, they, they basically gr grind to a halt at, at Saratoga, uh, and that's where the Americans will surround him. By that time, by the time they surround him um, on around the, I want to say, something like the, the 10th, 10th, 11th, something like that. By the time they surround uh, Burgoyne at Saratoga, the Americans now have about 17,000 troops. Mm -hmm. That many militia have shown up. Um, and so it's just, you know, um, after that, it's just negotiating a surrender at that point. Where did, uh, what was done with British, uh, troops that were captured? Yeah, that's one of the tragic episodes of Saratoga, I think, is, um, the, the, what Burgoyne lacks in, um, leadership, <laughs> he's, he makes up for in, uh, negotiating skills. So when he's, he sits down with, well, he doesn't. They don't sit down. They, they send messages back and forth. But basically, they negotiate the surrender of the, of the army. And Burgoyne skillfully maneuvers Gates into saying that um, 
okay, we'll, we'll, um, we'll surrender the army, but with the provision that they be exchanged, they'd be basically be allowed to go back to England with the provision that they'll never fight North America again. Okay, you know, just on the on the face of that, that sounds well, that's not so bad. Then the Americans don't have to deal with them, they don't have to feed them, they don't have to do anything. Well, except that you know, troops are fungible. So if you move that army back to England, that frees up six thousand troops in England to come fight in North America. So basically, you haven't lost anything. Mm -hmm. So it's a great it's a coup for the Brits uh, when they negotiate this, this these surrender terms with Gates. Um, so so. Once the surrender is signed, uh, Gates uh, marches the, um, uh, well, the Americans march the, the surrendered British and German troops to Boston with the idea that once they get to Boston, they'll board ships and they'll sail to England. Well, the Americans immediately, you know, Congress and Washington immediately put up a, uh, uh, a stink about those surrender terms because they realize that those are not good surrender terms. And so both sides start looking, both sides start accusing each other of violating the terms of the surrender. And so the, they, the Americans will use that uh, excuse to keep that army in North America under American guard, basically as POWs. So they're called the Convention Army because the, the surrender is not called the surrender of Burgoyne. It's called the, or, or it's not called the, uh, uh, the surrender document it isn't called a surrender document, it's called the Convention. So the convention of Saratoga. So the, this army that has surrendered to the Americans is called the convention army. Mm -hmm. And so what they do, what the Americans do is in order to keep them away from any British forces, they'll march these guys all over North America to keep them away from Brit the British army who, who would try to rescue them, obviously. Right. Um, and so these poor guys are marched all over the place. They're marched to Virginia. They're marched into Pennsylvania. They're marched all over the place. And of course, you know, it's the 18th century and many of them will die of disease. Many of them will um, die of exposure. They're not treated all that well. They're not given the, you know, food, proper food and medical treatment. Uh, and many of them will, will die. A lot of them will desert and become basically settle in, in North America and become Americans, uh, become American citizens later on. But it's really kind of a tragic, um, tragic follow on case to, uh, to Saratoga. Yeah. So yeah. They were again, they were supposed to go back to Britain. That would free up 6,000 troops who are in Britain to come back and fight the Americans, but it just never works out that way. Yeah. I had a, an earlier question when, when you mentioned the Brits and Germans deserting, I wondered where, where would they end up? You know, I guess the Brits could more easily um, hide yeah. uh, in the area, but the Germans, maybe the Germans too, I guess. Yeah, actually quite a few Germans end up uh, being, being Americans, mm -hmm. deserting and then staying in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, where would they, I mean, I wouldn't imagine they'd go to the cities necessarily, more the, the rural, you know, the countryside of the States. Yeah, that I don't, I, that I don't. Okay. That I don't know. But, but it's interesting reading the, uh, reading the letters of these German soldiers and mm -hmm. German officers, they were really taken by, by North America, by the physical, you know, I already mentioned they were, you know, the insects, you know, the bad things, of course, they didn't like the insects and the rattlesnakes and things like that, but they were really taken by the physical beauty. Uh, you, you saw that a lot. They talked about that a lot. You know? uh, for instance, when they, when they broke out of the wilderness and they, they at Fort Edward on their way south and there was the Hudson River uh, valley and they just talk about how gorgeous it was just just the the scenery uh and they they talk about the you know the prosperous farms they were running into and how nice that was and uh and that sort of thing and how the americans you know seemed really nice and, and and that sort of thing so they were really taken by the by uh american uh the american you know uh geography and americans mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I, I recall seeing some American demographic that, I don't know, maybe in 1900 or something, one fifth of the con country was German. Of yeah. German, uh, you know, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. a lot of Germans came to came to the United States. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the big the big bunch came when they were having all those revolutionary issues in what the 1840s, I think. But yeah. yeah. Um, 
And and also you mentioned the fortifications in the second battle, the British ones. I'm curious, were those temporary? What what were those like? Yeah, I mean they were field fortifications, you know, logs and trenches and stuff that they were just throwing up as best they could mm -hmm. uh, in the time they they had. But we're going, you know, it, after that first battle of Freeman's Farm, you know, I, he really should have probably retreated at that point. Actually, he probably should have retreated after the the Battle of Bennington on the 16th of August, um, mm -hmm. when he would have had a clear line of retreat fairly clear line of retreat back to Ticonderoga at least. Mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't, he continues to press on. He would argue later that, um, that his orders gave him no option except to press on to Albany no matter what. And of course, that's crazy. Any mm -hmm. senior officer knows that you have, to, you have to deal with circumstances on the ground, especially when you're following orders that were written in London five months before. Um, so, you know, circumstances change on the ground and in, in both in his original orders and in the letter he received from, um, from Howe in April of 1777, both of them directed him to use his initiative, you know, to, to use his best judgment at all times. And, and he'll argue later that, no, I, I had no option. I had to continue pressing south. Did he respect the American forces at all or was he, uh, I don't think he did until, until Bennington uh, and then the Battle of Freeman's Farm. He says in his, um, um, he admits in his testimony to a parliamentary committee afterwards that was investigating this disaster, uh, he admitted later that, uh, yeah, you know, um, if you hear anybody saying that the Americans can't fight, they're crazy because they can't. <laughs> and and he, he admits he was, he was wrong. And, and most British senior officers were wrong when they thought that the Americans couldn't fight. Did they have any kind of spy network in the area that they were using? Um, well, I mean, they had some loyalists that would give them some, some intelligence, um, but, but not, I mean, he was expecting, like I said, he was expecting this huge, huge um, rush of, of loyalists that would come out and help him. And that just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a, uh, a loyalist, um, that he meets up with in um, uh, Skeensboro, which is present day Whitehall, New York. It's the Southern, very Southern tip of Port, uh, uh, Lake Champlain. Um, he, he basically stays with the army uh, and, and helps, you know, helps provide intelligence and knowledge of the local terrain and that sort of thing. So he's got a few of those guys that are helping him out, but he doesn't, he doesn't gain a whole lot of good intelligence from, uh, from the loyalist network such as it is. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything that you found that had a, any strong emotional impact on you? Positive um, or negative? I know it's history research, so it might be dry, but yeah, no, I don't. I don't think it's dry at all. I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I wouldn't be doing it if if it was. Um, what, one thing that just, um, um, I, I guess it. Um, it touched me a little bit because I didn't know very much about it at all. And that was the siege of Fort Stanwix. Hmm. So, you know, remember I said there's three, there were supposed to be three columns. One, you know, Burgoyne's big column coming down from Canada, down Lake Champlain. And then the other one that was a smaller column, but it's supposed to come down the Mohawk River and also meet Burgoyne there at Albany. So that's a supporting attack. Um, and they run into this, very small American fort that guards the approaches to the Mohawk River called Fort Stanwix, also called Fort Schuyler. So I, 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 just, I just use Fort Stanwix in the book just to keep it consistent. And um, there's this very small American garrison there. It's commanded by a guy named Colonel Peter Gansevoort. And his second in command is a Lieutenant Colonel Willett. And these guys are, they're basically all on their own. I mean, they're way out there in the wilderness, way out on the American left flank, nobody to help them out. They're all on their own. There's only about 700 of them in this, you know, fairly run down old log and earthen fort that was built in the French and Indian war time. And they had been working hard to, you know, bring it up to speed. And he, He's faced with this, you know, he's outnumbered three to one when this British column shows up with a large contingent of Indians. Uh, and the, you know, the British commander basically says, surrender or we'll, you know, we're, we'll kill you all. 
Uh, and unlike what happens at Ticonderoga, where the Americans basically give up without hardly, almost without firing a shot, um, these guys, these guys hang in there and they basically say, over our dead body, we're not going anywhere. You're not getting past us. And they hold on for 22 days. Uh, and they basically will force that British column to retreat back into Canada. Mm. Uh, and they really, the, the leadership of these two young officers, they're both in their 20s. Um, these two young officers is just, um, is just amazing. And, and they just do this, this brilliant job of leadership uh, with their very small garrison holding out against uh, pretty significant odds um, for a long period of time. And they, they're, they're you know, instrumental in helping, um, helping win the campaign because Burgoyne is not going to have the aid of that column that's going to divert American attention as it comes down the Mohawk River. Yeah. So the yeah. siege of Fort Stanwix, I think, is a really interesting uh, piece of this campaign. It just shows, again, how many moving parts are in this campaign. I and mean, there's something like 11 uh, different battles and, and skirmishes and engagements. There's a couple sieges. Uh, there's all these, these really interesting movements throughout this, this very difficult terrain. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a campaign with lots and lots of moving parts, and that doesn't even talk about the strategy or anything else. What were the dimensions of Fort Stanwix? I'm just curious. Oh boy, how crowded in these guys were. Yeah. Oh, I want to say I'm. I, I'm probably wrong. Don't hold me to this, but I want to say maybe it was one of these these kind of classical star shaped forts. But I want to say about 300 feet on a side. Mm. It wasn't. It wasn't very big at all. Okay. Okay. And it's uh, today. I mean, I, um, I highly recommend anybody who's interested to go see it. They they reconstructed the fort to its, you know, pretty much how it looked like during the siege of Fort Stanwix in 1777. Mm. So I've been there. I mean, it's a fantastic reconstruction. Uh, it was, of course, all by itself back then. Now it's in the middle of uh, Rome, New York. <laughs> but, but it's really, really interesting. And you get a feel for the, the distance. And it's, it's a very small place. I mean, they were really crammed into this, uh, this fort. I also imagine the British had trouble moving artillery around they did. That's one of the controversies. You know, Burgoyne has a fairly big train of artillery that he, he brings with him. Mm -hmm. uh, some historians have said that, well, that because he was dragging this artillery, that's why he lost because he had to move so slowly. I don't buy that. There's, um, I, I don't think that was the case at all. Uh, it, it certainly hampered his movement, but, but it certainly wasn't the cause of his, his, uh, uh, his failure. Mm -hmm. But he felt he needed that because he thought that Ticonderoga, he was going to have to basically besiege Ticonderoga. Uh, turns out he didn't have to do that, um, but, but he thought he might. He thought he might run into other American fortifications as he continued south, so he thought he needed something like that. Hmm. Um, do you have any difficulties getting the book finished or published? Uh, no. I mean, the people at Oxford University Press were fantastic. I mean, they were really great to work with. So, mm -hmm. no. Um. Which year do you have a current writing project you're working on or going to? Not yet. I'm looking at two different possibilities. I'm thinking of maybe going back to my roots of uh, American uh, Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, that was subject of my first book. Um, and or or I might, you know, I'm also looking at maybe staying in the revolution. I I really enjoyed, like you said, there's been thousands and thousands of books on Washington, but I really enjoyed looking at Washington's role as commander in chief. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm thinking about maybe doing something along those lines, um, mm -hmm. only looking at it through the entire scope of the war and not just this, you know, narrow uh, 1777 period. So I, I'm, that's sort of what I'm looking at right now. Okay. And normally I always ask uh, what the author hopes a book will do. I feel like you answered it before, as far as you want modern day readers to take lessons of strategy from it. Is there anything else you'd add or is that basically? Uh, well, um, I, I, I mean, that, that's one thing I would like. I, I think um, if, if, you know, if senior leaders would read it, I, I'd like to think that they pull those lessons out. But for, for uh, a regular reader, um, I, I'd like to just, you know, show them how, um, uh, how important this campaign was, how extensive it was. When we think of Saratoga, we think of the two big battles at the end. And we don't think we, we, we seldom think about this grand scope of the campaign. And I, and I think folks need to know that really the, 
the genesis of what happens at in in seven you know in October of 1777 on the banks of the Hudson really started way back in London in December of 1776 and January 1776 all the way back then and then just to look at this this huge scope all these moving parts uh, and that um, really the one of the things that really jumps out at me um, is the resilience of the Americans during this whole thing. You know, they, they could have thrown in the towel after Ticonderoga, especially those, those soldiers up in the Northern Department. But yet most of those soldiers that basically gave up um, and, and um, uh, abandoned Fort Ticonderoga in a couple of days, they were, most of those soldiers were there at Battle of Freeman's Farm and the Battle of Bemis Heights. So they, they, I mean, just this resilience, they bounced back and they bounced back quickly. And why? Because of great leadership, um, you know, at great leadership that um, started with Schuyler. Uh, you know, Gates did a good job. Of course, Benedict Arnold. We didn't have any talked about him. Benedict Arnold, people like Gansevoort and Willett, um, just just really good leadership uh, from top to bottom on the American side. At the lower level, the Brits had fantastic leadership as well. Brigade commanders, regimental commanders, really, really good. Uh, it was at the the, the higher Higher levels that I think the Americans uh, had the advantage. Were the Ger German troops, were they, how did they rate compared to all the forces involved? Well, Burgoyne, after the, of course, after the fact, he blames, uh, he puts a lot of the blame on their disaster on the German troops. Yeah. Very unfair. He says, oh, the German general, uh, General Riedesel was his counter, a two star uh, general, Major General Riedesel. Uh, he praised Rita Sell, but he said, but his troops stunk. And they're one of the reasons why we lost. Uh, highly unfair. Um, he was, Burgoyne was, was really covering his butt uh, afterwards, just grasping for any excuse to, to explain the disaster when the vast majority of the disaster falls on his shoulders, in, in my opinion. Um, but but he, it's just another scapegoat that he was trying to uh, pick. But I, I think the Germans did, did pretty well. They didn't do a very good job during the Bennington battle, um, but their troops did. Uh, it's just, again, they were kind of let down with their leaders. Hmm. So where, where can people find your, your thoughts or updates on your work online? Do you have social media website? Uh, I don't. I should. I, I absolutely should. I don't. Um, but, um, you know, that's one of the things I probably should work at. Uh, but, but of course, it's on. It's the book is on Amazon. Uh, the book is on Oxford. Um, uh, in on the Oxford website, they've got um, um, uh, an interview with me, similar to what we've done, except I talk about what I think are the five top takeaways, and they also have a timeline uh, from the book as well in there. So, so that's a little bit extra that if people want to take a look at. They can look at that. Okay, good, good. Um, that's all the questions I have. Any final thoughts or words? No, no, I, I really appreciate that. I really enjoyed it. It was a great question. So it was fun talking about the book. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for watching this video version of Military History Inside Out. If you like this episode, please subscribe for more. If you want daily book suggestions for new military history and general American and world history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, WarScholar1945, and my website, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for new fiction and nonfiction books on sci-fi, fantasy, horror, gaming, film history, and more, check out chrisalvarez.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want new technology, science, space history, and space books, Check out technologyandspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. Thank you for listening.